Today I will go through uh, some historical work that has been done since I started my second life. Uh, my second life is in protein crystallography. My first life was a small molecule crystallography. Uh, for small to big uh, is a big jump. And um, since 1994, I was involved uh, or interested in, in neurodegenerative disease, in particular Alzheimer's. And more recently, thanks to a collaboration um, with Professor Catania, then at uh, CISA, about 15 years ago, more or less when I start working here in Trieste, we, I became interested in structural, structural and functional aspects of neuropathic pain. So before I go to the specific details of the two subjects or our contribution, I maybe uh, since this is a seminar in a series of seminars given by uh, collaborators from CNR, from different institutes and different subjects, I just wanted to you know, give some hints where we are. So most of you know we are based on the synchrotron uh, at the Letra. Our offices are here and our labs are over this building. And the beam line, the X81 beam line is more or less at this side of the ring. And recently a new facility has been built, the free electron laser, that I will show you some uh, hints how can be important for, for structural biology in, in the next few slides. So the ring has the name of Elettra. Elettra was the name, was the birth name of this yacht where, where Guglielmo Marconi in 1930, uh, actually recently it was the anniversary and his daughter, the princess Elettra Marconi was here at the Ara Science Park. Uh, and this is part of the uh, ruined uh, yacht recovered since about 20 years ago, uh, nearby Zara, because it was somehow sequestered by Germans just after the uh, September the 8th, 1943. And, um, and uh, the, the Americans just bombarded that area coming up. And so that was ruined, but now it's just a few meters from here. And the, and the other important point is that Guglielmo Marconi was our first president. He was the founder of the National Research Council, okay? So a bit of background, but very briefly, uh, why we use X-ray crystallography. And um, the main reason is because it's the only technique that will provide us detailed information at the at atomic level of uh, any molecule that can be in a specific state, which is ordered state, which is the crystal. Of course, there are also, I will show you later, uh, more advanced techniques, uh, which allow also to get structural information in solution. And this is the so-called small angle X-ray scattering technique. But this is the main technique that's been, uh, been used since of the beginning, 19, 20 or so, and uh, interesting, uh, we are now celebrating this year, the 2014 is the International Year of Crystallography. Uh, this year has been dedicated to crystallography by the United Nations, so we have a big celebration going on. And um, we also recall the, um, the, the first cent, uh, 100 year of, of discovery of the basic law that, con that is behind the diffraction experiment, which is the so-called uh, uh, Bragg law, which is given here. I will not give mathematical details of this, but just to mention just now, and then we will see later, that this is one of the not rare cases where the son and the father were acknowledged by a Nobel Prize at the same time. So the Lawrence, William Lawrence is the son, and Henry, William Henry is the father. They won the Nobel Prize in 1912, just by a simple, by beside this law, but because they were the first to demonstrate that X-ray can be used to determine small crystal structure. In particular, they solved the structure of sodium chloride. Okay, so at that time, you could won a Nobel Prize for that. <laughs> and on the right, of course, 
we have another, another person, which unfortunately was not awarded by a Nobel Prize, which is Rosalind Franklin, who definitely was the key person who led to the prize given to uh, Watson, Crick, and Wilkins for the discovery of the double helix, DNA double helix. And actually, this is the very famous uh, photography 51, which took years of work because the main goal was there to get a reasonable pattern and playing with many aspects related to moisture, type of cations, and so on. And that was a very difficult uh, task, but this was the, the, the picture that was somehow in bracket stolen by Maurice Wilkins and shown to, to Francis Creek and James Watson. And, and, and that, from there, they immediately recognized that there was a, definitely a lyrical structure. And looking at the spacing and how many of them, I, mean, I cannot give the details, but they could immediately see there was a double strand, was DNA pair every 10 bases. OK? Uh, just to say, this is the early days where, you know, uh, mostly was done, work was done on photographic films, but nowadays we have technology which came up, and this is the actual setup of the XRD1 beamline that the CNR share 50% with, in partnership with Elettra, and uh, up to very highly sophisticated detectors, uh, goniometers in which you mount your sample, cryostats, and not, not last, um, um, as an automatic sample changer, so you can control the experiment from your home, in principle. Okay, you can do remote data collection. So the experiment, just to show you, which is the simulation of a diffraction pattern of a single molecule and a periodically arranged in a crystal lattice, the same molecule, provide a discrete pattern. And this is the type of pattern that we have to deal with in order to get from the crystal through the, the diffraction experiment to the electron density maps, which allow us to build a three-dimensional model of, of our molecule, in principle, in this case, proteins. So we have all the ingredients beside one, which is the most important one. So the ingredients that we have from the, the experimental point of view are the amplitudes of the wave diffracted, but we miss the, the origin of the waves from, from they, they were come from. And this is, in, in our world, you know, scientific language, is called the phase problem. And in this equation that I will not give, of course, details, by knowing this, combining the phases with the amplitudes that we can record, then we can build the electron density map. There are several methods. I will not, of course, dig the table. Just I wanted to give you, it's not magic. You know, there is a lot of science behind it. And this is just to, uh, to, to show you an analogy between an optical light microscope and an X-ray crystallography experiment. In this case, you have an object, you have a visible light, and you have a system of objective lens which will focus uh, the uh, diffuse diffuse um, light and recombine, and you can see an enlarged view of your object. This is more or less the same, but this is done by, with X-rays. This is a crystal. This is the point, the key point, where we enter the game. So we are the crystallographers here, this little man who has to do the job of combining the, the amplitude and look for phases in order to get the image. And this is what I call the optic mathematical lens, because we here is development of mathematical tools in order to simulate the optical lens. In other words, there is no lens until now that is able to recombine X-ray dif beam <coughs> diffraction. Okay, so this is the reason why we are th th this this job exists for us. Otherwise, uh, and, uh, and uh, so if you like. Uh, and in between, there is, a, but I, I don't have time to go through it, we have, of course, electron microscopy, which is a way to focus diffraction by electrons. Uh, and, uh, and we get an image which is nowadays much, much closer to almost atomic level, but not yet at fully atomic level. Okay. So 
our main motto is going from genes to drugs by crystallography. And this is a picture of different crystals. So this came to my mind that uh, something that I always say that protein crystallization is an art, but protein crystallography is a science. And being an art is very emotional and very often is not repetitive, are sort of irreproducible. Okay, so this is the reason why we need some technology in order to be able to reproduce crystallization experiments or crystallization screen in a more systematic and reliable way. And this is the reason why robotics came in the, into, the, into the game already about 10 years ago or so. And we have, these are some uh, pictures taken from what we have in our lab at the Electra. Uh, this is a facility shared with the Electra Synchrotron at Trieste. And uh, these are different type of robotic system for dealing for preparation of the crystallization screening for the setup of the drops, uh, different setups. And again, a, also a very useful uh, system for visualization and uh, storage of the crystallization plates. So you don't need to go and look at by eye once by once, but you can from home or from a computer periodically uh, look at the crystallization conditions. So why I say this is crystallization is, a, is, a, is an art and crystallography is a science because um, James Sumner won the Nobel Prize in 1946, Nobel Prize in Chemistry, for this discovery that enzymes can be crystallized. Uh, and the crystals were active. Okay, so this means that the enzyme was an active molecule. And the, actually the enzyme who, uh, that he crystallized was uh, a new race uh, from Jack Bean, so from this Cannavalia enciformis. And uh, this, enzymes, uh, this enzyme catalyzed the reaction of urea with water to produce carbon dioxide and ammonia. I mean, I will not give the detail, I mean, but the enzyme is a catalyst, so speed up not only the speed up, not too much the speed of the reaction, but very much reduce the temperature with the reaction occur. In absence of, of the enzyme, the same reaction in water need 100 degrees, while in presence of the enzyme, you can do, go down at 21 degrees. Uh, so the major point from this crystal, this crystal were available since, as you can imagine, since then or even earlier but nobody were able to solve the structure, okay? And there were some problems related to the crystal. This is a glycoprotein. So therefore, you need very highly sophisticated um, chromatographic technique in order to have an homogeneous preparation of, this, of the protein. And this was the successful attempt run by Carte Ponurai uh, from Madras University that after 83 years, where the first crystals were obtained, they were able to solve the structure. So this tells you the difficulties in this journey from the protein to the structure. It can be a can be few days or sometimes even few hours. It can be years. Okay, so it's, nobody can predict this. I mean, not me. <laughs> so just to let you know how much it's known about general structures. Uh, in the PDB currently, there are deposited almost 100,000 structures. And, but there is some very interesting point to, 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 uh, that I would like to point out is the following. Of course, there is a you know, number of proteins increase over the years since 1972 was the database was established. And one of the goals of the Structural Genomics Project was to determine the 3D structure of all proteins belonging to any genome, okay? But it, the reason for doing this it was because we wanted to know as much as possible about uh, diversity in folding, in folding stru structures. Folding. So, but that was uh, something very, that was a nightmare, actually. And indeed, this year, the uh, uh, NIH decided to don't found any longer structural genomics project, okay? And you can see from this picture, actually. 
So the number of proteins increase along the years, but the number of new folds since 2000, about now about six, seven years, is completely missing. So we don't get, we do more structures, but we don't get the information that we wanted to discover new folds. And I, I have one explanation for this I, one, in one second. So th this is really impressive. And the maximum here that you can find is related to the accessibility to the synchrotron radiation facilities, to very high speed detectors, and of methods. So you have a combination of the development of all these aspects uh, in order to get this high number crunching. One of the reasons that I think is the reason why we, we are a little bit lacking here is that membrane proteins, which are approximately 10% of sequence of our, in general, of any genome, there are only very few available. In, in, at the moment, by a few days ago, there were 466 unique crystal structures. There are many more because complexes with ligands and so on, but the unique are only few. Comparing to this number, you see we are very, very, very little information about this completely different world. And um, so therefore, um, Maybe this is one of the reasons, okay? But these are also the most difficult to, to express, purify, and crystallize proteins. Overall, we have a sort of lagging time of about 20 years, 20, 25 years, between membrane proteins and soluble proteins, okay? You can interrupt any time, so if you have a question, this is very informal. So what about the future? in structural biology. The future is here, so these big GANS machines, which are the X-ray free electron lasers. Why this? Because you can even perform crystal structure by getting crystal grown in vivo, okay? And this is one example. This is a, a, um, a procatepsin B, which is the cysteine proteinases, proteinase, isolated, the crystal is this crystal, which is this here, and this is um, um, SF9 insect cell. So you could detect this crystal inside the cell, and you could hit exactly this position, and you get this information from a cell. And you imagine that the crystal is one micron size. Okay, we are speaking of extremely small crystal. In some cases, there are like this one, which is the most recently work on a, a photosynthetic reaction center. They are sub-nanometer small. So we have about 500 nanometer size crystals. Okay, the problem is that you need many, many small crystals because this is what we call in, in our you know, language, serial crystallography. <laughs> so we have to, to prepare a suspension of microcrystal. This is a way through the, the dream that everybody is looking for to have just a single molecule, not any longer crystal, not even small crystals, but even single molecule. <laughs> so in other words, we have to go back to the first spectrum that I show you, which is the diffuse scattering. And, so, but now we are more or less much closer to something around few hundred, few thousand molecules in a crystal, comparing to the millions of molecules in a normal size crystal. So, was it crystal? It, they are small. They are still crystals. These are still crystals, not single, isolated single molecule. But that is the way. That that is the direction where uh, technology is pushing. Okay. The other point is that you have to have a very intense beam, and this is the reason why we need free electron lasers compared to synchrotrons. And there are a lot of mathematical uh, uh, methodology behind this. Uh, I wanted just to, okay, it's somehow summarize here. So you have to imagine, you know, like a, a mass spec inject system where the, 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 the suspension of the crystal is ejected and the beam catch, but the crystals are oriented randomly. 
So you have to then collect <coughs> all the images, average those who are uh, close enough in terms of orientation, you need pattern recognition, and then by the oversample theory you can build your model, which is this, the result. So this is now feasible. This is a paper just came out at the end of 2013. Unfortunately, we cannot do this experiment here at Electra because the, the, the free electron laser that is an Electra based in Electra is in the UV range, not in the X-ray range. But nevertheless, UV is a nice also uh, range of, of, of wavelength for spectroscopic study where you added the four dimension, which is the time. So you can follow chemical reaction or protein-protein interaction in, in time. At the, with pulse of femtoseconds. So we are comparing to synchrotrons where you can do also time resolve experiment in the order of milliseconds. On the synchrotrons you are, on, on the fell you are in the femtosecond scale, okay? So I just mentioned this other technique which is a small angle X-ray where you need, you don't need crystals but you, you have a protein in solution and nevertheless you get sometimes very useful information particularly where you deal with not just one protein, but macromolecular assemblies, okay? Protein proteins or more than, you know, big machinery, you get at least information on the shape uh, and, uh, and I cannot give, I cannot go into detail, but this is a quite powerful technique that can be um, somehow uh, coupled with, multi, with other techniques like mass spec, electron microscopy, NMR, ultra-analytical ultra-centrifugation, uh, uh, FRET, because all these techniques will provide you with uh, some restraints on which you could filter the proper solution that will fit in the best way these scattering curves. Because in principle, we are speaking of a resolution between, in the best case, between 10 and 30 Ohmstrom resolution. So we are far from atomic resolution. But in, in that type range of resolution, the arrangement, like a system like this, can be, you know, can be quite a, a challenge to, to fit a curve. But if you have restraint by other techniques, you can somehow reduce the possible solution that will properly fit your solution curves, scattering curve. Okay, just the last slide, I think, is just to mention that crystallography has been the subject of several Nobel Prize directly or indirectly. I want to just, I just already mentioned the, the two Braggs, the father and the son, but I also wish to mention another case, uh, which should be, should be, should be, should be, should be here. Roger Comber, who studied the molecular basis of a eukaryotic transcription, particularly polymerases. And interestingly, his father, in 1956, I think, won the Nobel Prize in medicine for the discovery of the DNA polymerase. So this is another case of a father and a son. Uh, there are more or less 49 uh, involved in this. Uh, they cover most aspects from the discovery of the X-ray to the fact that the crystal diffract X-rays, uh, the, the use of the X-ray for solving the crystal structure and so on. Uh, I, I just wanted to mention this because uh, we are in Italy, and this is the only, Giulio Natta is the only Nobel Prize in chemistry in Italian, uh, that thanks to crystallography could characterize a very magic, a very magic material, which um, some of you that have my age might remember on TV, Gino Bramieri sketching for Moplen, Mo Mo Moplen, and exactly Moplen was a polymer that Giulio Natta uh, discovered and characterized. Uh, this, this was in 1963. Okay, so sorry for this sort of introduction. Maybe I jump, I use most. For... Okay, so I will deal mostly with two aspects of neurodegenerative. One is related to Alzheimer, particularly cholinergic uh, deficit, so acetylcholinesterase inhibition, and in the um, neuropathic pain, the neurotrophic deficit, somehow trying to understand the role of NGF, if we want to NGF on or off, and how we can play with this in order to uh, uh, somehow 
influence and somehow deal with this, uh, with the chronic pain. So Alzheimer's disease, I will not give very much detail, but just wanted to mention this is a very, demand, very important and more and more uh, um, uh, important disease. There are an num increasing number of people due to the ailed, old people. So there is quite a few high percentage of people with more than 85 years old that suffer of this disease. And interestingly, over the years, the number of deaths that for, for standard, for let's say common disease like cancer is decreasing, or HIV is decreasing, while for Alzheimer's disease there is a huge increase in percentage of death. What is interesting is that in 1982, the NIH research budget for Alzheimer was just $20 million. Today is 584 billion. So there is a huge amount of money investment in this. And this is also due to the fact that the, the direct cost of caring of these people is really a lot. For this year, it was estimated of $203 billion. In, by 2050, is estimated this will rise, increase up to $1.2 trillion. So this is a real problem. So maybe some of you know, some other know, so I will go briefly to this slide. So the, the disease causes irreversible cognitive decline, and there are a number of mechanisms behind this. Uh, the classic symptoms are uh, two hallmarks, so the formation of beta amyloid deposits, the plaques, and the twist of strands of uh, the, the tau protein, which can provide the tangles. And there are multiple pathways likely to be involved in AD, which are the cholinergic deficit, inflammation, neurotrophic deficit, epigenetic factors, and so on. But there is no unitary theory that can account for all the clinical and neuropathological case at the moment known. So this is still a big subject. Uh, this is the, these are uh, the number of uh, drugs that have been approved by FDA. From, uh, the, for different stages of the disease. You, you can start from mild, moderate, and um, uh, to severe. And uh, some of these drugs are more effective according to which stage you, have, um, you get the disease, which, which stage you want to address the disease. And they are from, um, this is a synthetic compound. This is a recept. This, are, um, this is galantamine, which is a natural compound. Uh, rivastigmine and tacrine, which was the first on the market, but was, it now is very occasionally used because of a lot of hepatotoxicity side effects. So I would say that the most common drugs are rivastigmine, galantamine, and aricept. Uh, memantine is starting to be used, um, but has also some uh, not clear relation with the inhibition of the MDA receptors. So basically, what, why we are interested in inhibiting acetylcholinesterase, just according to the so-called cholinergic uh, uh, hypothesis. So we want to compensate with drugs to a nicotinic cholinergic deficit. And why this? So when acetylcholine is... Uh, uh, release on the presynapses, he, he will encounter mainly two targets. One is the acetylcholinesterase, and the other are the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors on, on the um, postsynaptic um, membrane. And by interacting with these receptors, the um, ion flow will occur through the cells, and so this will provide the full transmission of the, um, uh, 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 of the signal. So what's happened when, um, so somehow the receptors in this view are acting as a delay loop, okay? Normally, the two at the end of the day, in a normal person, at the end, all the acetylcholine molecule will be degraded to collate and acetate. And this very much depends on the local concentration of acetylcholinesterase and the receptors. In Alzheimer's disease, one of the uh, hypotheses or somehow some, some proofs are that the number 
of uh, receptors on the surface are reduced in number, so the density of the receptor are reduced in number, one, one aspect, and the other aspect, they are less, they show less affinity towards acetylcholine. So therefore, the only way to overcome this problem is to locally increase the acetylcholine concentration. And this is the reason why we inhibit acetylcholine esterase in order to have a local increase concentration due to the low affinity, we hope that by mass effect, the receptors will bind the, the, uh, the acetylcholine will bind the, the receptor. Then mostly what this will do is to um, not only the channel state, be in the open state of the channel, but mostly to control the slow closing uh, step of the channels. Interestingly, there are two molecules, galantamine and fisostigmine, which besides have been um, inhibitors of acetylcholinesterase, they are also, uh, mm, there are evidence that they also act as um, a ligand potentiator, allosteric potentiator of the receptors. So they have a sort of double, dual, dual function. Briefly, which is the mechanism of action of acetylcholinesterase? So it's, uh, it's, a, it's an esterase, so you have a, a catalytic trial built by serine, histidine, and glutamic acid. Uh, there is a transfer of the hydrogen from the serine to the, to the histidine. This will provide the formation of tetrahedral intermediate. Then there will be release of the, of the um, uh, the formation of the acylated enzyme with the release of the collate, and then a water molecule will reattack and then regenerate the enzyme through the formation of a tetrahedral intermediate again. So the structure was solved some years ago. Was uh, the first acetylcholinesterase uh, was isolated and purified from uh, a fish from Torpedo Californica, a ray fish, uh, and uh, this is one of. My collaborators, a German guy, who spent some time in the United States, in California, so he was able to prepare for us some electroplugs from where we purify the enzyme. And um, these are the crystal. This is a typical uh, X-ray diffraction pattern. And the structure, as I mentioned, was solved more in, in the early 90s by Joel Sussman at the Weizmann Institute. And immediately what came up from this structure was the knowledge that the, the active site of the enzyme was buried in a very deep and long gorge, about 20 angstrom uh, uh, depth, lined by mostly aromatic, aromatic residues. And this somehow explained the huge electric dipole moment of 1,000 debye. Okay? Although this structure was, uh, was somehow uh, of course, interesting, but also puzzle a lot to understand how the product of the reaction are released. Because one way would be that the products are released through the entrance or most possibly through a backdoor. And that was an open question for many years uh, until about six, seven years ago. Okay? Uh, we, did, we, we contributed to to answer to this question somehow, and I will show you in a moment how. So the inhibitors are, I will not give, I will not go in this in details of this slide, but just to wanted to, to mention that the most common inhibitors are so-called carbamate-like inhibitor, which are which mechanism of action is somehow simulating the substrate, um, um, substrate, uh, um, the acetylcholine substrate. So what we are interested in developing inhibitors which have fast carbomylation, so the first step, the formation of a deacylated enzyme, but at very slow regeneration of the active enzyme. And these are the first series of compounds with we will deal dealt. Uh, this belongs to the physostigmine that was isolated from this uh, plant, which is actually um, the beans are poison. Uh, but physostigmine is the, up to now is the most potent inhibitor of acetylcholinesterase, although with a big, big problem. 
the half-life time of this molecule is 20 minutes, less than half an hour. So that is, from the pharmacological point of view, is a big problem. So therefore, a lot of work in our group, in particular Mario Brufani in, in Rome, uh, no, just the structure was available, the crystal structure was, so we develop uh, inhibitors with a very long um, al alkylic and hydrophobic chain in order to fill the gorge as much as possible. But of course, immediately, one, and that was the, de the, um, the development of this molecule called heptastigmine, uh, that actually was sort of um, 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 that was taken over by Merck for some time, but that, that compound was then abandoned because there was some problems in their clinical trials. But in the meantime, we also wanted to play with a, prob with a big problem in pharmacology where we use this compound is the crossing of the brain-blood uh, um, barrier. And to do that, we, we decide to play with the PKA of this... Uh, moiety here, which is a morpholino moiety. And, and in, in this case, we got a very nice results in terms of blood bro in brain blood barrier pen uh, penetration. So uh, what is interesting that all these compounds, as you say, have the same first rate constant, so this very fast carbomylation, but by improving a lot the de second step, so the decarbamylation, we now have a drug which can be last by, say, sort of days. Okay, but all these experiments are done in vitro, of course, yes. So in vivo, this is much, it's completely different. But, but. So we, this is more or less the summary. We play with different endalkyl chains, and um, the optimal one for the crystallographic study was chosen to be this one with alkyl chain eight, and this was our first work where we publish in biochemistry the structure. We could nicely trace the molecule inside the gorge and the morpholino group there. But of course, the big question was where the living group is. There was no trace of living group in the, in the protein crystal structure. So therefore, the hypothesis somehow started to, you know, uh, we, we hypothesized that the main exit was not through the gorge because it was completely filled by this, by this part of the molecule, but most probably and most likely from this part of the molecule, which is a tryptophan, which can easily swing out and in with no energy cost and act as a sort of uh, security exit, if you like. Okay? Uh, the main problem that the referees didn't accept very much this. But at the end, they accepted. But we couldn't see any difference between the position of this tryptophan in the non-inhibited structure and the inhibited one. But this is somehow clear because this enzymes works at the diffusion speed. So this has to be very quick up and down. If you think how many molecules of acetylcholine this enzyme has to cleave per second in our body, just like this, maybe millions <laughs> in few seconds, okay? So this is main, the, in the crystal, because all, everything has been done by soaking the active enzyme with this molecule, and the result of the catalytic reaction is in the crystal, not in solution, but within the crystal. Okay, we go now to another family of inhibitors, this galantamines. We were interested in, in this, particularly uh, the precursor. And why this? Because as I mentioned, these are, besides to be inhibitors of acetylcholine esterase, they are also allosteric potentiators of the uh, nicotinic acetylcholine uh, receptors. And this is very clearly shown in this patch clamp experiment on PC12 uh, 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 cell. And if you look at the electric response, this is sort of the scale, 200 picoampere, two second for the... Um, um, uh, can inactivation kinetic. So what, what you see is uh, if you provide a hundred uh, micromolar concentration of acetylcholine, you get this response. If you had, beside the hundred, you also had 0 0.4 micromolar of this inhibitor, you will immediately see an increase 
in the response beside the, the, the inactivation kinetic is very similar. While if you gave just the galantamine, you don't observe any, anything. And if you just provide a huge dose of acetylcholine, you get more or less the same amplitude, but the kinetic inactivation kinetics are quite different. Not only that, but you also, you can also, by looking at this curve, normalizing them, you can also see that uh, in, in the presence, um, uh, <clears throat> in the presence of, of galantamine, there is an increase of affinity of acetylcholines towards um, uh, the receptors by at least uh, one log unit, uh, because you observe a shift of the acetylcholine concentration required to get, even getting the same maximum response, okay? So the structure will solve. Uh, very surprisingly, there were very few interaction of the molecule with the, with the enzyme just through the catalytic serine. There is an hydrogen bond of this oxygen here to, to this. And um, a, a, the interaction of this hydroxyl with two, the two glutamates, glutamates and aspartate in this. So very few interaction. Uh, so at the same time, we wanted to have, to have an improved inhibitor, but also uh, more or less in the years that we were working, a, two papers by uh, Ines Stroza, is, uh, from Chile, from the Università Católica de Santiago, uh, no, the um, Concepcion. Uh, he published two nice papers in which he showed that acetylcholinesterase accelerate assembly of amyloid beta peptides in Alzheimer's. And particularly, he suggests that is the surface of acetylcholinesterase which is responsible for this. So since then, a big rush has been you know, between chemists to develop new inhibitors that were able not only to inhibit the enzyme, but also to inhibit the aggregation of the beta amyloid peptides. So therefore, a number of different uh, uh, derivatives with some linkers and some uh, groups were developed. And we started to do some modeling studies. And uh, the modeling study came out uh, based on previous structure, uh, Aricept and our carbamylated enzyme, all pointed out that this alkyl chain extends along the gorge, both in the case of uh, propyl chain or this exyl chain. The, the were most problematic issue to, to address were the orientation of this chain from this benzazepine like ring could be equatorial or axial. This could not, I mean, this cannot be easily predicted. Okay. So when we did the structure, we were sort of surprised. The, the short length was actually didn't extend along the gorge, but just fold over itself. So it's like a scorpion tail, okay? Uh, of course, this could never be predicted if we didn't do the structure. So this is one of the key points that I wanted to address. At certain milestone of your drug delivery process, you need a structural information because this was a complete surprise, okay? I cannot have time to go in the details of the rest. So instead, the exil uh, uh, alkyl chain derivative was as expected uh, going through through the full, the full gorge. Uh, not only that, but even if you have a, uh, an extended molecule like ours, uh, in the same time a group, a structure from the group of Sussman was came out, a galantamine with a different um, moiety here at the top of the molecule. And again, there were differences and could not be predicted by molecular model on any docking that the, the substitution at this position could be again equatorial or axial. And indeed, they were different. So again, even small, small uh, subtle um, chemical aspect, stereochemical chemical aspect 
cannot be easily predicted by molecular computational methods. So you have to, at certain point, verify your hypothesis with a, with a structure. Uh, I will not, okay, these are mm, people that collaborated over the different subjects and, and, and inhibitors that I didn't have time to show. Uh, and uh, okay, so I go now to the second, quickly to the second part of the talk. Uh, um, so I think I have sort of 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Um, which be, uh, is the role of NGF uh, in, in chronic pain. So again, chronic pain is becoming an important issue in society. I just give some, I mean, there is a huge pharma market of billions of dollars uh, with different molecules already in the market. And in, you can see the worldwide number of patients is increasing. This is a picture of 2008, and this is what is expected in in a few years, and uh, what is really impressive is the cost, the social cost, means in loss of productivity due to this type of, of disease, particularly uh, art, due to arthritis, uh, headache, back problems, muscular condition, that is about, at the moment, estimated to be $62 billion. So it, 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 it is again, um, uh, a big problem, and there is no, no novel therapy that are safe and effective besides using, in some cases, opioids, which, of course, have side effects. So just quickly, which is the, the reason which there is the connection between chronic pain or pain in general with, with the uh, neurotrophic uh, system. So as soon as uh, an injury occurs at the level of the accent, uh, there will be a release of, an, of a growth factor, neuroregulin, which binds to the receptor RBB2, which in turn uh, um, causes the, the secretion of the nerve growth factor or the glia-derived nerve growth factor, which by interacting with specific receptor, in the case of NGF, the tyrosine kinase A receptor, uh, uh, pro, pro, causes the, the um, the triggering of a signal cascade, which is responsible for the uh, hypersensitivity to, to pain. So which, uh, what we wanted to address is to dissect the role of NGF in, in this type of interaction, in particular with, with trache. And uh, this was the part that, of the work that I started when I started collaborating with Antonino Cattaneo <coughs> almost 10 years ago. I was uh, I wanted just to point out here that um, the first cDNA sequence of the human NGF was performed by uh, Professor Baralle, who is now the director general here, back in 1990s in, when he was in, in, in Milan. Um, so what we wanted to, to understand is um, which are the molecular determinants responsible for the interaction of the NGF and and, uh, and, the, and and trache. Uh, just a few words about trache. Trache is a is a transmembrane protein. is built by a number of domains, which is cysteine-rich domain, leucine-rich domain, two Ig-like domains. And then you have uh, an intracellular uh, um, uh, tyrosine kinase domain. Uh, which um, when the, the ligand binds, this, this causes the dimerization of this receptor and um, following by phosphorylation of some tyrosines, but there is a spe specific tyrosine, tyrosine 491, uh, which then can uh, trigger the starting of the signaling order to hypersensitivity through this pathway involving PKC or isotyphosphenol free or through this pathway that go nervous survival and growth or neural differentiation and hypersensitivity. So it's a very complex system. I, I don't have really very much time now to go in all these details. What I wanted to, to mention that one approach that we decide to pursue is to use uh, not, of course, opioids, opioids to resolve the problem, but to use uh, a, a more sophisticated approach to use neutralizing um, molecules, in particular antibodies, 
in order to uh, block the interaction between the uh, um, ligand, the NGF, and, and, and the receptor. Um, that was our experimental strategy uh, that also led to the um, to have um, transgenic mice in which uh, um, these recombinant antibodies were secreted or, um, or uh, intracellularly produced proteins. And, and, and this would allow them to, to have model system to study this type of interaction or the way to block them. In particular, the, the, the antibodies were expressed in this type, two type of mice called alpha 11 and MN. CA13. These are the two small uh, mice here. So uh, this is a very specific interaction. And what we want is to characterize them at the molecular level. This is the sort of overview. What we are willing to do is to study in specific this inhibitor, which is by interacting with TRAC-A, will avoid the interaction of NGF, or to block with another inhibitor, the ligand that is behind the philosophy behind this um, uh, neuroantibody studies. So we solve the structures and characterize them uh, by different methods. Uh, in particular, uh, we determine by uh, surface plasma resonance the specificity of the mouse uh, MNC3 antibody versus TRAC A, while it was negative between P75 or P75. P P75. So this means that there is P75 is another uh, uh, receptor also involved in, um, in interaction with, with NGF. Uh, they both form the so-called high affinity receptors. Uh, they have different uh, affinity versus the ligand, the low and the high. Uh, uh, TRAC A is high affinity and P75 is the low affinity receptor. Uh, but this antibody specifically blocks the interaction with the ty tyrosine kinase A. So we then did uh, an epitope mapping on the uh, TRAC-A receptor by building a number of deletion mutants. And to make a long story short, we identify that the epitope is based on the Ig, so-called Ig1, uh, so the D4 domain. Uh, of the ectodomain of tyrosine kinase A. And interestingly, this domain carries a missense mutation, L to P, which is responsible for a congenital insensitive to pain with anhydrosis. This is CHIPA, is a genetic disease. And in particular, we were able to, to detect quite reasonably that the epitope sequence on track A is, uh, is this one. Uh, we then developed, and we patented in 2005, a method to humanize this antibody for therapeutic use. Uh, this method differs from the published methods and patent method by the fact that it's based on a structure of the parental antibody. We use the structure of the parental antibody in order, I would just go a couple of slides on just to explain then I will go back, okay, here. This is for the, for the other one, for the alpha DNA, but the principle was applied the same to them. So what we did is to take the structure of MNC13 as a FAB, uh, purified by IgG just as a standard papain digestion, nothing really special at that level, and we look at in the database uh, which human or humanized um, um, FIB fragments were known from the structural point of view. And so then we look at, at the, the best scoring in terms of super structural superimposition and amino acid sequence identity and homology. And after this search, we, we identify this one, this IGPGPS, um, as a PDB code, which um, actually is a, is, a, is a humanized FIB against a tissue factor as the best candidate to use for humanization. So uh, therefore, we, with, with this method, we were able, with just one cycle, we were able to, to have a humanized antibody which uh, beautifully responds in, a, in an, an ELISA assay comparing also to a chimeric uh, uh, FIB. 
So this is uh, one of the main goals that we achieved. So our approach was very, very effective, uh, particularly, but you have to know the structure of your parental antibody. This is one, one key point. Uh, uh, we, yes, we did also Biacor, of course, on the humanized uh, antibody, and we could detect that KD is about 2.79, no, 2.79 nanomolar um, affinity. We did some uh, assays also in PC12 cells, and in, in, the, in, the, in the presence of, uh, M, of NGF, in the presence of NGF and the mock FIB, and in the presence of um, of uh, human, human um, antibodies, so you can see that the growing is much reduced. Uh, so it, the same story was for the other antibody. I go a little bit quicker here. I wanted just to stop here that we, in order to, this time it was a little bit more difficult to, to detect the epitope because this is an anti-NGF. So we had to have a number of we had almost 40 different point mutants, double mutants, and triple mutants uh, of NGF in order to be able to detect the epitope on, on NGF. And but eventually, we succeed in this. And uh, what we did by, it was also to, uh, OK, we characterize as with the others, as others for the, for the humanization done in the same way. So you have a very, very good uh, humanized uh, antibody with a, an affinity of the pico or femtomolar range uh, comparing to, to, the, to the rat. And these are the biocores. One, when we immobilize the uh, parental uh, monoclonal antibody, and here were the NGF on the opposite, just to be sure that they were not... not uh, uh, strange effects on the, on, particularly on the stoichiometry of the, the, of the interaction. Uh, and I will show you that actually what, okay, this is, I already show, we did exactly the same type of experiment, so the very, very good um, um, uh, antibody. But what we were interested in mostly is to look at the stoichiometry uh, of the interaction. And in this case, by uh, pairwise epitome mapping, we were able to detect the stoichiometry that was one NGF towards two FIB molecules. And using the information from the epitome mapping, by docking, we were able to build the model of the complex. But models are models. So we wanted to validate this model. And uh, since we didn't have really enough material, because this is quite expensive to produce, all these two proteins. We went to uh, X-ray um, solution scattering experiment. And what is really impressive is that this model beautifully fitted the X-ray curve, the scattering curve. So we were really now very confident that this is the, uh, the way the uh, antibody interact with NGF, and particularly involving the loops one and two of NGF. And we, this is to be sure that the geometry was one to one, one to two. We also, or two to one, depends on how you read it. But we also did some uh, um, uh, size exclusion chromatography experiment. And it, this is the, the, the NGF, this is the FIB, and this is uh, the uh, unbound FIB, and these are the uh, two to one and one to one um, complexes. So we have also in solution uh, the one-to-one -one complex beside the two-to-one -one complex. So what we are going now, we wanted to characterize better the interaction of M and NC13 with the D4 and D5 domains. In particular, we are recombinantly expressing these two domains and in order to, to study this. And all this, the goal actually, at the end, will be um, to devise small molecules which are responsible uh, in order to somehow break the interaction, but not using antibodies, which are very expensive, but to design small molecules able to um, uh, somehow break the interaction between the ligand and the receptors, or, or uh, allow uh, you know, to avoid the interaction of NGF on the receptor itself, either blocking the ligand or the, the, the receptor. 
Okay, these are more or less the people over the years involved. I, all this work, of course, could not be done without the contribution of all these people. And I finish by thanking you and by wishing that the brain forces be with, with us and, of course, have a joyful Easter. <laughs>